beginning at verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, reading uh, to verse 12. Uh, we'll read that and then get into our study. Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses. God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Father, we lift up this portion of Scripture. We ask that you would speak to our hearts that we might serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so what are we looking at? Well, Paul is coming under attack. Early in the history of the church, and we saw this as we went through the book of Acts together, early in the history of the church, false teachers had begun infiltrating and influencing believers. When we uh, would look at, if we were to look at, for example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you'll see that. And the Thessalonians are being influenced. So when you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2, it says this. Listen, he says, Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So spiritual infiltrators early in the history of the church had already begun entering in to influence the people and draw them away from the doctrine of the apostles. That would help us to understand his introduction here in chapter 2 when he said, you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. That would help us to understand why he says that. He, he's, he's combating the influence of the false teachers by appealing to their personal experience with him. You see, Paul had come to Thessalonica. He had actually been ministering in that area. He had been in a church called Philippi, a place called Philippi where he had planted a church. He went to Thessalonica, and he planted a work there. And we see that in Acts chapter 17. So in Acts chapter 17, by the time he had made his way to Thessalonica, he had done ministry there. We know that some of the Jews who had listened to him had come to faith in Christ, and a great multitude of Greeks had also. And so what had happened is he had become what we would today refer to as a father in the faith. He had, he had a father's love and protection, uh, protective interest for these people. And he didn't want the false teachers to undermine the truth that he had been given, giving to his children. It's reminding me, it reminds me of, of another church in the similar area in, in the church of Corinth. How he had written to them in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. And he had said to the Corinthian church, I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I've betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So he had a father's protective love for these people, these Thessalonians. And so he's speaking to them and, and he's, he's appealing to them and, and he says, and notice in verse 1, he says, you yourselves know. And so by saying that, Paul is contrasting himself with the false teachers. He's reminding his readers of their relationship. He's reminding them of his ministry to them. He's already begun to point that out. In chapter 1, we saw this. He had reminded them of his consistent life that he had lived. In verse 5 of chapter 1, he said, You know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So he used his, his life as an example of genuine Christian faith 
And he did so because he loved them. One of the things that I would share with pastors, but I share this in a general way, is that we are models in many, many ways, especially pastors. We are models of faith for other believers. And when a pastor fails to live properly, that pastor undermines the faith of other believers. In Paul's case, his consistent, faithful life had earned their respect. And that's why he said in chapter 1, verse 6, that they had become followers of him as well as followers of the Lord. In other words, they, they used him and other believers as models of Christian faith. Imitation is a foundational way of teaching people how to live for the Lord. That's how I learned to pray, by praying with people. That's how I learned to read my Bible, by, by seeing that others read theirs. That's, that's how I learned the importance of fellowship, by being with other people as well as, as learning how to share my faith, by watching and imitating others. I learned to pray. I, I learned to read. I learned to, to fellowship. I learned to share. And that's how it normally works. And Paul used himself as a model, and he encouraged people to use him as their example. When he was writing, again, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he said this. He said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. If everybody imitated me, or if everybody imitated you in your way of living, how much glory would God get for that? And so Paul is saying, you can use me as an example in Philippians 3.17, he said to them, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. So he loved. He loved God. He loved people. And his faith was on display before them. They saw its reality. His works lined up with his words, the words that he shared with others. So loving God and loving people, living a pure life, obeying God, loving his word, Sharing the gospel, encouraging others to walk worthy of the gospel is all part of how he trained them. So he's writing, and he's reminding them of his ministry fruit. They themselves are fruitful. They're reproducing, they're growing, they're flourishing, even though they're under affliction. We saw that in chapter 1. It's evidence that he's teaching them the truth. He had pointed out that their lives are filled with zeal and endurance under hardship, and they're living with a sustained anticipation of being with the Lord Jesus Christ. He pointed out that they're evangelistic, that they share their faith constantly and faithfully. He had said, from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth like a, like a blast of a trumpet, like the sound of, of thunder. You're evangelizing the surrounding areas. You're sharing people with people about Christ. And, and according to chapter 1, verse 9, you've become examples of believers, two believers in Macedonia and Achaia. You, you left idolatry, he said. And though the majority of the people in the area are idolaters, you no longer are. You worship the true and the living God. And in doing so, you have come into the counterculture. You are in opposition to the pagan culture that you live in. And you are also patiently, he said in verse 10, and eagerly awaiting the return of Christ. You see, their desire to see the Lord, their desire to go to heaven was their hope. It was their motivation for living. Why is that? Well, Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have a sustained anticipation. You have a hope of seeing him. You are waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, he had said in verse 10 of chapter 1. This sustained anticipation, this, is, this desire to see him reminds me of something Job said in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27 in that book, where Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. So, Paul is dealing with some who are infiltrating and undermining his teachings. How do you deal with that? Well, we're going to see that here in chapter 2. He's, he's going to do it by refreshing their memories of him 
of his ministry amongst them and his ministry itself. They had been saved, and Paul calls them to remember how they were saved. He says in verse 1, You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. You were saved. And Paul is reminding them how they got saved. They got saved through his ministry. And because they were saved through his ministry, that ought to commend him to them. They are his evidence. The fact that a church exists in your city should evidence that I've been called to minister to you. It reminds me of something, once again, that he wrote to the Corinthians when he said in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You've been saved because Paul had come and preached the gospel to them. The fact that a church existed was evidence that God was using him. Notice again, he said, you yourselves know. And when he's doing that, he's establishing his ministry credentials. You were saved because God had sent me to preach to you. To combat the influence of the false teachers, he's reminding them of some things. And, and what we're going to see in the first 12 verses of chapter 2 is we're going to see the credibility and the compassion and the conviction that he has as a ministry. Because credibility, compassion, and conviction are earmarks of a minister. And so in verse 2 he says, even after we were even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. He begins by establishing credibility. And that's what we're going to be looking at for a moment. Paul had paid a price for preaching the gospel. Paul had gone through many trials and many afflictions, and they were aware of them. He reminds them... And notice with me how he does that. He says they were suffered, verse 2, we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. He reminds them of what had taken place. In Acts 16, verses 16 through 39, uh, Acts records that Paul and Silas had been ministering in a city called Philippi. Remember that, how a demonized young woman who was a soothsayer had been delivered, the demon had been cast out of her, and, and the result had been uh, a physical beating by a mob and false imprisonment and unjust accusations and, and a scourging that he and Silas had endured in spite of the fact that they were Romans. Well, these, these events were well known by the Thessalonians. And by bringing that up, it's a simple way of saying you're not the only ones who are suffering afflictions for faith in Christ. He's saying... I have two, as well as Silas, who is introduced, by the way, in verse 1 when, by the name Silvanus. We have also suffered for our faith, but we have remained faithful to him. Now, after that had taken place there they, they, in, in Philippi, they had come to Thessalonica. And, and how had they responded to the beating and the unjust way they were treated. Well, notice verse 2. He says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Instead of us being quiet about Christ, we came to Thessalonica and we preached. We were bold and we continued preaching even though resistance was great. We were bold in our God and we spoke the gospel to you. In Acts 17 verse 5, it tells us that a mob is gathered and they had set, set the city in an uproar. Their faithfulness in the face of affliction and rejection established credibility. The fact that they suffered in this way revealed a deep faith in the message and a love for the people. What was the origin of this? Why did they have such boldness? Why did they speak in such a way? Because it says we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Well, notice verse 2. He said, our exhortation didn't come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. What is the origin? It's a clean conscience, a knowledge that God has tested them and trusted them. 
He says our exhortation in verse 3. The word exhortation is an appeal. An exhortation is an urging to take a certain line of action. He says our exhortation didn't come from error. The word error speaks of a polluted source. We're not leading anyone astray. Our, our appeal to you is not coming from a polluted source. We're, we're asking you to do, do the right thing. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, he had said to them, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We didn't come to you speaking in an improper way. We didn't have an, a polluted source that we we're deriving our message from. We're speaking to you in the power of God. He says, our, our motives are pure. We're not doing it in uncleanness. We're not using you for personal financial profit. We're not seeking man's honor. Again, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 2.17, he had said, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. We're not peddling God's word. We're not corrupting it to make it more appealing. We're not saying things that you want to hear so that you can become followers of us. He said, we're not using deceit. When he speaks concerning deceit and all of that, that speaks of catching a fish with bait. We're, we're not trapping you hypocritically. We're not being crafty. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, we've renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves every man's conscience in the sight of God. We're not attempting to craft a message to become popular and to profit from you. We're not doing this to appeal to you. You know, in a lot of ways today, ministers can be hesitant to preach what the Bible says. There are so many people that are, are prone to, to believe what they feel is true rather than what the Scripture reveals, that it becomes difficult. And some pastors can get so tired of having people in their opposition and saying things that are just so argumentatively angry that they get to the point where they water down the gospel because they don't want to lose people. Paul wasn't that way at all. Paul didn't use deceit. Paul didn't speak from error like it says in verse 3 or uncleanness. Why didn't you speak like that, Paul? Well, verse 4, because we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, and even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. We've been entrusted. We've been approved. When he says in verse 4, we have been approved by God, the word approved means to be recognized as genuine after examination, after testing. We have been tested by God. Proverbs 17.3 says it like this, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. We have gone through fiery trials. Our faith has been refined and it's been purified through these afflictions. We did not alter the message to be approved by you even though we've gone through so many conflicts and so much affliction and so many trials, so much pain and so much suffering that didn't force us to change the word to be approved by you. Why is that? Because God's message is something that he's entrusted us with. God has entrusted us, verse 4, with the gospel. God has put confidence in us. He's given us this most special message. And it's motivating me to continue living and speaking in a way that pleases him. He's giving to us the keys of the kingdom. Now, I don't know how many of us in this room have uh, raised kids. You know, I'm... I'm a veteran of that, if you will, raising kids. And uh, I taught all four of them how to drive. So I'm sorry. <laughs> but I remember taking them, every one of them, when they reached 15 and a half, and off we go. And I'm teaching them, you know, going into a parking lot, letting them drive back and forth, learning how to back up, learning how to park, 
taking them on the street and then, you know, um, just doing the best that I could to help them to, to be aware of the responsibility of driving and the things that pertain to that. And, and so they finally went, they took their driver's license test and, and they passed. And then the day comes when they want to borrow my car to take a ride. And some of you understand that. They want to drive my car. And I didn't, they didn't have their own car. They had to borrow someone's. So they wanted mine. And I still remember looking at them, and I mean grilling them. Where are you going to go? How long are you going to be gone? Uh, what streets are you going to take? And all of that. And then they have all the, the answers down. Well, we're going to go here. We're going to be gone this long, and this is how I'm going to go. And then I gave them the keys like that. And that was just to a car. That was just to a car. God entrusted you and me, think about it for a minute, with the keys to the kingdom. Not a car. The kingdom. The kingdom of God. The keys to the kingdom are the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he didn't shake as he handed us the keys. He empowered us to take that word out so people could hear, be saved, and go to heaven. You have the gospel, and you've been entrusted with it. Sometimes we treat our cars as more important than heaven itself. We're more concerned and shaken about the keys to our cars or our homes than we are the kingdom of God. And God has given to us. And that's why Paul is saying, I have been entrusted. I have been tested and proven to be faithful. And he handed me the keys. And I, handed, and I treated you in the way I should treat you because I treated the gospel in the way I should treat the gospel. And I did not come to you speaking in order to try and draw you to, to myself. I, I didn't speak to you out of, out of uh, error or cleanness or in deceit. Why is that? Because I've been approved. I've been tested and tried by God to be entrusted with this message. And so I speak, he's saying in verse 4, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. I'm not going to change the gospel because you don't like it. I'm going to tell you the truth. And that's what pastors are supposed to do even if people don't like it and they don't they get so angry sometimes I, I've had people here in this fellowship I, I still remember someone standing off here to my left standing up flipping me off and saying some real sweet things to me and I said listen John I'm not going to hire you if you treat speaking treat me like that and speak to me that way it's so unflattering you shouldn't do that I mean, they get upset. But he said, we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Galatians 1.10, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. He was a well-known rabbi. He gave everything up to follow Jesus Christ, and it, and it led to his ultimate beheading outside of Rome. He said, if I wanted to be pleasing to men, I already was as a rabbi. But now I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. He said, no, I've been tested. I've been approved. And so, with that kind of heart, we brought you the word of God. Verse 5, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. You know that wherever I've gone, my ministry has been performed with integrity. We haven't flattered you. We didn't appeal to your vanity. We didn't appeal to your sense of self-importance. Instead, we spoke to you a message that brought conviction, even warning you of danger. In verse 5, he says, nor a cloak for covetousness. We didn't hide greed for gain by saying what you wanted to hear. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, unlike so many... We do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as though sent from God. He said, we are deceivers. We could have made demands, but we're not. You see, deceivers are more concerned with the finances than the spiritual health of the people. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, Peter was speaking concerning deceivers entering into the church, and he said, by covetousness, they'll exploit you with deceptive words. 
During the time of Christ, when Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, Matthew 23, verse 14, he spoke to the Pharisees and the scribes. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. For a pretense, you make long prayers. Therefore, you'll receive greater condemnation. We didn't use this as a cloak for covetous. As God is our witness, verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. I didn't seek man's honor. I didn't abuse my authority. As an apostle, I could have made demands on you because I have authority, but I never took advantage of you. I never abused my privilege. You see, Paul had authority, but he used it lovingly when he was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 14 and 15. He said, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. You see, instead of lording it over you, I've shown you love. Like Peter in 1 Peter 5, 2 says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. And so he's speaking concerning these things to them, and, and he goes on in verse 7, and he says, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. And the first few verses, he has established credibility. But now he begins to give to us a sense of his compassion. Notice how he speaks here. Notice he says, we were gentle among you, like a, a nursing mother cherishes her children. We were affectionately longing for you, meaning we tenderly loved you. And we imparted not only the gospel, but also our own lives. What is he saying? He's saying, you are dear to me, and I want you to know that I love you deeply. I want you to know that I have given you my heart and all of my efforts have been for your good. I want you to know how deeply I love you. Like he says to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 8, God is my witness how greatly I long for you, for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. I love you. I want to do more than impart knowledge. Knowledge is very important and I want to impart it properly to you, of course. But I also have imparted not only the knowledge of the gospel, but I've imparted my own life. I've yielded up my life that you might grow in Christ. He uses the, the picture, verse 7, of a nursing mother, how she cherishes her own children. A nursing mother must be close to her child just to nurse the baby. And for those of you mamas who nursed and those of us fathers who, who witnessed the nursing that, that our wives um, did with, with our babies, well, we saw that there was a tenderness and there was a love, there's a patience, there's a bonding that took place with that mama and that baby. We saw how she sacrificed her time, her tenderness, how she had patience. We saw how she protected that baby. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I've, I've cared for you. I've loved you. I've nurtured you. I've yielded myself for you. I love you. And that compassion that he has. The fact that he can say, you saw me speak with boldness, but you saw how I treated you. Compassion in ministry is a very important element for a pastor to have. It's a very important element for, for people of God to have a, a heart of compassion, a heart of concern for others, a, 
sensitivity to their pain and sorrows that they, that they go through that helps us to care for them. And he's saying that. He's saying, listen, when a mama holds and protects her baby and she bonds with that baby and there's that tenderness as the baby feeds, he said, even so, I have a, a love for you with a gentleness and a, a concern. And, and I wanted you to know that, that not only am I giving you the word of God, but even as I've done so, I've given you my own life. In the midst of all the affliction, in the midst of all the persecution, in all the things that I've gone through, I've remained faithful to God and, and to you. And, and what I've done, well, it can cost me my life, but I want you to know that I'm willing to yield it on your behalf, even as a mother would take care of her baby. I, re, I will never forget seeing a, an actual picture, a true picture of a mother who was caring for her infant baby when an attack came upon her village. And there was a picture that somebody who was, who was reporting for the news and all of that, uh, that uh, took time to take and published it. And I saw it as it had been published. And there was a mother laying on top of the baby as bullets were flying all around her. And I'll never forget seeing the love that mom had for that baby. I'll never forget that and how that impacted my heart to see that she was willing to give her life up. And Paul is saying, that's how I feel towards you. I'll give up my life for you. That's the love I have for you. There's this tenderness. There's this kindness. There was this patience with him because he fiercely cared for them. And he tells them in verse 9, you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You remember our labor. The labor is speaking just of physical toil. The, the, the word toil <laughs> speaks about how difficult it is, how tiring it is, how hard it is. Paul and his team had worked with their hands during the day. They ministered at night. We saw in Acts chapter 18, verse 3, how that rabbis would often have trades that provided income for them, and Paul was a tent maker. He worked with his hands to keep himself from the accusation of self-interest, and he wanted to avoid being a financial burden to these people. In 2 Thessalonians, he says it in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. He says in verse 10, you are witnesses in God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You are witnesses. Accusations have been made, but you have firsthand seen my life. We have lived in an open fashion before you and before God. We have lived devoutly, which speaks of holiness in his life. We have, we have lived justly, meaning that we've been upright. We have lived blamelessly. We, we haven't a moral spot. Uh, our way of life is, is godly, and this has earned your respect. I want you to see how he says in verse 11, you know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. I've encouraged you to live a godly life, and I've shown you how it's done. This is where his conviction is shown. He's explaining and modeling this kind of life for them. I want you to notice he's speaking as a father. That's a, ma a masculine model. A, a mother's love was used to be a picture of nurturing, but the father's is a picture of being instructive. In other words, gentleness and tenderness should be balanced by strength and authority. 
I'm treating you like a father. I have treated you like a father would treat his own children. I have encouraged you. I have admonished you. Notice he says, I've exhorted. I, I've called you to my side to encourage you. I, I, I've, I've, I've loved you like a dad loves his little boy or his little girl. <laughs> I, I've had this father's exhortation where, where I've, I've, I've wanted to help you. And I've, and I've, I, I, I've done so because it will make you a, a stronger, stronger church. I want you to have a, a life that's pleasing to God. I want you to live a holy life. It's like what it says in Proverbs 1.10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Proverbs 3, 1, my son, do not forget my law. Let your heart keep my commands. He says, so I've exhorted you, but I've also comforted you. I, I've calmed you, and I've, and I've consoled you. You're going through affliction. You're going through distress. So I've been there like a dad who holds his children and encourages them. When they're hurting, I remember my son. He was now a man with his own babies, my Joseph. When he was around nine years old, how he came into my room while I was sitting on the bed and he walked up and said, Dad, could you pray for me? And of course, I said, no. No, I said, of course. <laughs> of course, son. What do you want me to pray for? That I'll be picked for a team to play. He said, Dad, they... They pick teams at school, and, uh, and I can play, but he said, they don't, they don't choose me. And uh, my little son, my son at that age, had a tender little spirit. And I remember sitting there on the bed as he was standing in front of me, and he said, and he's looking up, and he says, Daddy, they, they don't choose me, and I know how to play. I can play. And he teared up. My mind goes to the moment. I'm sorry, I have to bring it back. And I held him. And I rocked him like he was just a little baby. I held him. And I prayed for him. And I comforted him. And I told him, you can do it, Papa. God is going to be with you. You'll be all right. Hold on. You'll be okay. He needed me. He needed his dad. And as a dad, I can understand what that feels like. I can understand to have the talent and the gifting and the ability, but no one's choosing you. I understand that. When I was nine years old, ten years old, and I was in Little League, we used to, in Little League in Norwalk, we had three divisions. We had the Pioneer, Pacific, and the Majors. When I was pioneer, I got drafted the next year at the age of 10 to the majors. I was a good ball player, but I sat the bench. I sat the bench for 20 games. I played in the three exhibition games and 23 games in total, I played nine innings. I know what it's like to sit with a glove, to want to play but never dirty your uniform. I know what that's like. To be able to play, to be good enough to play, but not be allowed to. And my mind, as my son, is telling me how rejected he felt. Goes back to understand, I went through the same thing. And I held him, and I encouraged him because I can come from that place. And guess what? When you're feeling rejected, Jesus knows what it's like to be rejected by men, and he will hold you in your time of pain, and he will say, it's going to be all right. I'm going to put you in. Don't worry about it. I am telling you from practical experience, I, I have a, I, my, my father does it, and he, in, in, a, in a very spiritual way, I was able to minister to my son, you'll be all right, son. God will use you. You'll be all right. And that's what fathers do. 
That's what, that's what happens here. He said, I was like a dad. I was consoling you. I was calming you. A mother is tender and loving, but I consoled you in your pain. And he says, and, and as this is taking place, under verse 11, I also charged you. I encouraged you. I, I, I gave you a testimony uh, uh, by divine revelation of doing that, which God has told you to do. It's like what it says in Proverbs 4.10. Hear, my son, receive my sayings. The years of your life will be many or Proverbs 5, 1 and 2, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Listen carefully. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. And God will take care of you. Why is that? Verse 12. He speaks with the conviction that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That you will have a life that pleases God and is not a reproach to him. You see, the gospel presents a way of life that is different. The gospel presents to us and gives to us the qualities of love and patience, kindness, as well as compassion. And a person who is a follower of Christ has a life that reveals this kind of relationship. The gospel is a message of transformation. And the one who is saved should walk worthy of that gospel. In Colossians 1.10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. We are living testimonies of the life-changing message of the gospel. In Titus 2.14, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good, and that is made possible by the Spirit of God and his word. It is preserved by fellowship with other believers and service to God. And so we are to walk worthy of the transforming and God-honoring gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because the world is lost and we are living testimonies of the grace of God in his ability to work and transform a human being's life. And the way we live ought to be the life that gives glory to God because we're working appropriately. We're walking appropriately. The word worthy means to appropriately walk. We are living in an appropriate way because the gospel calls us to be in a certain way and we live that way. And people can look at us and can say, that's a life that is sold out. For Jesus Christ. When I was a little boy, my mother tried to teach me a lesson that I grew to understand as I grew older. I can still remember going to a couple's house or friends of my parents. My brother Frank and I didn't want to go to this house. They had no kids. We had to sit there in the front room just doing nothing for hours. Well, my parents were having a good time. He and I were just sitting there. We didn't want to go. And, uh, you know, being kids, we made it pretty clear we didn't want to go. And we're sitting with our arms folded in the back seat and we're angry. I still remember my mom turning around from the front seat there in the car and leaning towards us the way moms can do. She didn't have her chancla, but she was pretty close to it. <laughs> and she said it like this. She said, we're going to a couple's house and these people respect your father. That's how my mom would speak to us. These people respect your father. You better not do anything to bring dishonor to his name. That was my mom. You better not do anything to bring dishonor to his name. They respect your father. My brother and I lightened up because when mom went on the war, war path, there was blood. <laughs> and I wasn't about to shed any of that. I didn't understand what she meant. These people respect your father. Don't dishonor his name. I do now. I want people to honor my father's name. And when they know that I'm his son, I better walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Walk worthy of the gospel because the world is watching. They're looking for real evidence that God is alive. And when you live in a way that demonstrates that God has changed you and earns the respect of people, they're willing to listen when you speak because you're not telling them to do something you yourself aren't doing. 
You're telling them to do that which God has commanded you to do, and your life is living proof that God has saved you. You're walking worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ.